On today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, did Warner Brothers move Dune 2 out of Oscar season just to kiss up to Christopher Nolan? Also, my most anticipated movie of September isn't what you think. Also, Disney Plus has canceled three major shows, but what does that also tell us about their overall philosophy moving forward? John Wick Chapter 5, Keanu Reeves says F yes, he wants to do it. And Warner Brothers has reportedly lost 300 to $500 million due to the strike. We're going to talk about that stuff and a whole bunch more. The John Campy Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet, the John Camp Show podcast, coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming and all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different from ours. I'm joined in studio today by Ray Ora. It's Tuesday, baby! Woo! It's Ahsoka Day! Oh, no. It's just Tuesday. <laughs> just, you know, no, just Tuesday. Uh, Jonathan Boyko's here. <laughs> eh, give that a B minus. <laughs> and of course, Chris Carr is in here today. Chris, how are you doing? Hello, everyone. I'm doing quite well. Thank you. And most importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here, making this show part of your day. Here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to start off by talking about all those topics that I listed off, and then we're going to spend the last part of the show taking questions from our YouTube channel members that we ask them to send in every single day. All right. That all down. Let's dive into it here, shall we? And we're going to start off with this. You know, the Oscar race got a whole lot more interesting and a whole lot easier if you're Christopher Nolan and Oppenheimer when Warner Brothers announced that they were moving Dune 2, the proverbial favorites going into this Oscar season, out of its current release date and into, I believe, March of 2024, which, of course, makes it ineligible for the upcoming Oscars. They'll have to be eligible for next year's Oscars. Now, of course, the first Dune won the most Oscars that year, won six. Didn't win Best Picture, but it won six Oscars. It's an incredible film, probably my most anticipated film of the year. And a lot of people are excited about it, but out of the running now. And a lot of people have had a lot of questions about the motivations behind why they moved it. But could one of them be because Warner Brothers really just wants to get back together with Christopher Nolan? Uh, that's the topic of today's Mint Mobile hotline question of the day. Listen, if you guys have a question or a topic for the show and like to hear your voice on it, go ahead and call our Mint Mobile hotline number anytime 24-7 at 951-268-4259. Once again, today's question is, did Warner Brothers just do this to butter up to Christopher Nolan? Check it out. Hey, John, uh, Francois here. I'm calling because I have a question about the delaying of June 2, I want to know if you think that this might be related to Warner Brothers trying to clear out the Oscar race for Oppenheimer in an effort to get Christopher Nolan back to Warner Brothers. So I just wanted to have your opinion, your opinion on that. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thanks a lot for calling that in, Francois. And yeah, look, the breakup of Warner Brothers and Christopher Nolan was public. It was dramatic. And it was nasty. Um, as Christopher Nolan wrote some pretty damning stuff. Now, of course, uh, this all goes and gets tied back to when Warner Brothers, under, at the time, the ownership of AT&T and CEO Jason Klar, decided to release all their movies for 2021 or 2022. I'm losing track of time now. Mm -hmm. But release all their movies that year on HBO Max the same day and date that it went out into theaters. And this pissed off all of their partners, all of their directors, and everybody. And it really pissed off Christopher Nolan. Well, it really pissed off Denis Villeneuve. But it really pissed off Christopher Nolan, and who is a complete advocate of the theatrical experience for movies, all that kind of stuff. And it spelt the end of their relationship. They were gone. Now, it should be noted that the people who owned Warner Brothers at the time are no longer the owners at Warner Brothers. AT&T does not own them anymore. Jason Kalar, who made that decision, is no longer CEO there. It's now owned by Discovery, Warner Brothers Discovery, as they're now called, and the CEO is David Zaslav. And it should be also be pointed out that it was a few months ago that uh, David Zaslav and Christopher Nolan were seen having lunch together. 
It also needs to be noted that this is not professional sports, although I often treat it like professional sports. It's not. It's not like a player signs to one team and that's the only team they can play for, right? LeBron James can't go out and just play for the New York Knicks one night if he wants to. No, he has to play for the Lakers if he's going to play. That's not how Hollywood works. You know, project to project. An actor can go and do a movie for Universal. The next week they can go and do a movie for Paramount. The next week they can go and do a movie for Disney if they want. Same with directors. Some production companies will have first look deals, notwithstanding, but that's basically the way it is. So Christopher Nolan can go and make a movie with them anytime he wants. So why did Warner Brothers move Dune out? The reality is them moving it has nothing to do with kissing up to Christopher Nolan. Because look, if anything, let's say Christopher Nolan now wins some Oscars for Oppenheimer. And believe me, Oppenheimer's Oscars chances just got a hell of a lot better with Dune moving out of there. So what's going to look better to Christopher Nolan? That Warner Brothers moved a movie for him? Well, now Universal can go to Christopher Nolan and say, see, you make a movie with us, you win all kinds of Oscars, Christopher. Isn't that great? You won your first Best Director because you were working with us. If it does anything, him winning a lot more Oscars this year is actually going to probably cement him in wanting to work more with Universal. So that would probably be a pretty bad move on Warner Brothers' part. But it really comes down to this. It's about money. Warner Brothers wants to make as much money with Dune 2 as possible. And if you're Warner Brothers, you got to ask yourself this question. Are we going to make more money with Dune 2 if we release it? When was it supposed to come out? November or December? It's supposed to come out in November. Yeah. November. Are we going to make more money releasing Dune 2 in November with none of our cast promoting it because there's an actor strike going on? Or are we going to make more money on Dune 2 if we push it out to March and have all of our cast out stumping for the film and promoting the film. I want to remind you guys, look at the cast of this movie. Bring this up. This movie has Florence Pugh, Rebecca Ferguson, Austin Butler, Dave Bautista, Javier Bardem, by the way, Academy Award winner Javier Bardem, Josh Brolin, Leah Sado, Stellan Skarsgård, Timothy Chalamet, and Zendaya. Oh, and Christopher Walken. Oh, and Tim Blake Nelson. Oh, and, oh, and, oh, and. Look at this list. Look at this roster. Are you going to make more money putting this movie out in November with trailers? Or are you going to make more money with this movie putting it out in March and then have Javier Bardem, Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, Josh Brolin, Lisa Sadu, Stellan Skarsgård, Dave Bautista, Austin Butler, Florence P. Rebecca First, and all going out to all the late night talk shows, going out to all the events, and telling all the public, come and see this movie. Now, doing that isn't going to turn Dune from a $700 million movie into a $1.5 billion movie, but you know it's going to make a difference. And at the end of the day, that is, and I'm sure there's a lot of other small factors, but at the end of the day, this is really the factor. This is the one that made them move it. Like, And it's not like, I made the comparison before, Chris, to uh, the upcoming Color Purple, where that movie looks incredible, but there's no need to move it because in, in reality, it's not a wall-to-wall -wall household name filled actors in it. So you're not going Aside to lose as much not That's having them sad. out on the press tour, right? Yeah. But you got Dune, Florence Pugh, Pugh, Javier Bardem, Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, Austin Butler. You're just name after name after name that you can really benefit from it. I think at the end of the day, this is it. Chris, the, the question posed to us is, could this really have anything to do with Warner Brothers trying to warm up their relationship with Christopher Nolan by moving it out? Uh, is it a factor? Is it the factor? Do you think it has more to do with, with what I think it is, which is the promotion of the film? I don't know. How do you see it? I can understand why someone would ask this because, I mean, this sets Oppenheimer up so well for the Academy Awards. It really, really does by moving Dune, by taking out its biggest potential competition. But this comes down to the promotion of it all. You have a cast like that, not only because they're all fantastic actors, but because they are going to put butts in seats. And already, as we're going to talk about later, Warner Brothers needs money. <laughs> they need <laughs> money. So making sure that this incredible cast that has huge followings on social media and otherwise, 
they get to promote this film and they get to make sure that people want to come see it. I think this is the move is they're doing that just so hopefully the strike is going to be over by the time the movie actually comes out and everyone can be hanging out on late night talking about what an amazing time they had riding sandworms and shit. <laughs> uh, by the way, all of the things being equal, I think this movie makes more money in November with the whole cast promoting it than it does in March with the whole cast promoting it. But I, I, I don't think there's it's very even close. I think March with the cast promoting it or November without the cast promoting it, I, I think March you is You don't want a replay if the whole situation we had with Dune 1. You yeah. know, of sure, everyone could promote it, but it just also was in your home. Yeah. So why would you go out and see it? Still living that very intense pandemic life. By the way, even though it was available to be viewing at home, made more money than Black Adam. Just Damn. throw that out there. Wow. Uh, anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think? Uh, do you could you see other maybe possibilities why they moved it? I think it's exclusively about the promotion of the strikes. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right. With that down, I want to talk about this. You know, I'd totally forgotten about this movie because I think they actually went into production on this movie prior to the pandemic. I think this movie's been in works that long. But Michael Jai's Jai, Michael Jai White's uh, the Outlaw Johnny Black is a movie that's been in the works for a long time. It's kind of like a spiritual successor to, I will use the word, masterpiece Black Dynamite. Black Dynamite, all seriousness, oh my God. Black Dynamite is one of the <laughs> best experiences I ever had in a movie theater. It was just, a, it was a raunchous crowd. Michael Jai White was there. Uh, I was sitting like behind uh Craig Robinson from the office and that watching this movie that dude I yeah, every once in a while you go to movie theater and there's one guy who's just like like uncontrollably laughing so loud at bells in the entire theater that was that was Craig <laughs> Robinson in this movie this that movie was such a joy to watch it was so much fun to watch and it made me just fall in love with Michael Jai White I mean I always liked him anyway but I mean that's put up the next level and now we got the outlaw Johnny Black trailer came out for it about a month ago and if you have not seen the trailer for it yet, I highly recommend that you do. It is truly the spiritual successor to Black Dynamite. And it is coming out. What's the date again? Is September 15th? Or yeah, September 15th. 15th, they're, like next week sometime? Yeah, there's some early uh, uh, screenings on the 14th, but the 15th is the official date. Right. And it's, it's, it's limited. So it's only playing in like one AMC theater around here. Yeah. But it is officially my most anticipated film of September. Now, you, you might say, well, John, like, what about Dumb Money? Uh, technically speaking, Dumb Money's official full wide nation release is October 5th or October 6th. So even though it's going to have a limited run sometime in September, I'm going to move that out to October and say that's October. So I'm clearing the way yeah. <laughs> to call it this. And listen, Michael Jai White is just a guy who obviously known a lot for his martial arts prowess. A lot of, you know, younger audiences will know him too from his uh, online Mortal Kombat stuff. He's just, and of course he was in the Arrowverse as well. But in Black Dynamite, we saw that he really had a great sense of comedic timing <laughs> yeah. as well. And this trailer to me is hilarious because I hadn't seen it yet. And Jonathan was saying, you know, it's not a great trailer, but I can't wait to see this movie. I'm like, oh, let me watch it. Because this kind of comedy is hard to make a trailer for. Yeah. It's true. Yep. You're because you have to right. have context in everything. But we sat down and we started watching it. Me, Ray, and Jonathan started watching it. And Jonathan just said, I know it's a bad trailer and everything, but I can't wait to watch this. And I'm watching this. And I'm like, I think this is my favorite trailer <laughs> of the year. I think this is the best trailer of the yeah. year. I love this thing. And it is officially my number one most anticipated movie for this month. I cannot wait. Nobody's talking about it. I've been guilty of that too. We haven't been talking about the outlaw Johnny Black around here either. But damn it, sign me up. This looks amazing. And if it even gives me 60%, if it even just gives me 60% of the experience I had watching Black Dynamite, then this is going to be great. I can't wait. Chris, you got around to watching the trailer yeah. for it. I, I mean, Jonathan's right. This is a, a difficult kind of humor to put into a trailer. It's also a kind of humor that admittedly isn't for everybody. It's not mm -hmm. going to hit everybody the same way. Humor's difficult that way. Yeah. I don't know. What did you think about it? And it looks fun. To it? And it is, you know, if you watch an old trailer for like Blazing Saddles or things like that, yeah, that's it's what hard I was thinking. to yeah. get that kind of vibe, yeah. right? And nail it. But this looks really, really fun. I, 
anytime I can support Spawn, come on. <laughs> that's right. You, I saw you watch the trailer. You go, and you said, go get him, Spawn. I'm like, which? Oh, that's yeah. right, Michael J. White. I got White. so excited. Yeah. I love Michael J. White. Uh, and this is a really great cast too. You've got Kim Whitley in there. You got an Inka Noni Rose. You have Barry Boswick, who I freaking love. I think he's so funny. So I would definitely go see this. This looks like a really fun time. And I love kind of spoofy, slapsticky movies like this too. I love satire that really just gets wacky. So I, I think this could be a really fun there's, one. So there's only one, there's only one rating so far on on to Rotten Tomatoes, but oh. it's a, it's from Flickering Myth. Michael Jai White's best film yet is one of the year's biggest surprises. A smart and wild western comedy with something to say. Here's the thing with movies like with like uh, Black Dynamite, they are incredibly intelligent. Yeah, and, they're very smart. And right? those jokes, they they hit deep. Like that that's what I love about it. It is smart slapstick, and that's hard mm -hmm. to come by these days yeah i remember and and he also does a lot of inside baseball stuff by yep. the way <laughs> michael J. white has also written and directed this movie which he did not direct black dynamite but he's directed this one but i remember in black dynamite he'll he'll tell a lot of inside baseball jokes that will not everybody will get because only if you live in la <laughs> particularly in hollywood are you familiar with Roth, roscoe's chicken and waffles mm -hmm. the place they were to eat see they were familiar with me Right. That's how familiar I was with it. Yeah. I, like, oh, yes. They're familiar with me. I love Roscoe's chicken and waffles. I mean, President Obama would go there when he'd be in town, stuff like that. I was lucky that it was only like when I first moved to Hollywood, it was only about a 15 minute walk from where I lived. And it's exactly what it sounds it's Roscoe's chicken and waffles. But in Black Dynamite, they had this running gag where a couple of times in the movie, they go to this diner <laughs> and it's run by a guy named Roscoe. And okay. like, it started off with, uh, oh yeah, the, the name of the, I think the diner, at first the name of the diner was Roscoe's Donuts and Cigarettes. <laughs> and every time they go in, he's changing the name. He's trying to play with the name. <laughs> and then it's some scene, like they're in the diner talking, some characters are talking and Roscoe's just walking by and the characters go, you know, it's like going in there and seeing chicken and seeing waffles. And the guy, Roscoe stops and goes, and then just walks out of frame. You're like, only if you lived anywhere else in the country, you would have no idea what that was even talking about. But it just goes to the fact that he'll tell a lot of inside baseball stuff. He'll tell some really intelligent comedy behind the slapstickness of it. And I, for one, can't wait to see this movie. My number one most anticipated movie of September. All right, guys, listen, we got more stuff to get to here. But before we do, we're going to take a quick second and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends at HelloFresh and DraftKings. Guys, we want to thank a sponsor of this video, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Kickstart a fresh fall routine with HelloFresh. HelloFresh handles all the meal planning and shopping to deliver everything you need to cook up a tasty meal right at home. They do the hard part and you get to take the credit. HelloFresh takes the stress out of mealtime by delivering fresh ingredients and easy recipes right to your door. So this fall, skip that extra trip to the grocery store and have dinner ready in no time with America's number one meal kit. Like we've mentioned before, Ann and I are both working professionals and meal time is sometimes a bit stressful. That's why we absolutely love HelloFresh. It's nutritious, it's delicious, and we actually have a really good time making dinner together. So guys, go to hellofresh.com slash 50 Campia and use the code 50 Campia for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50 Campia and use the code 50 Campia. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, DraftKings. Can you believe we've had seven months without an NFL game? Crazy, right? Well, good thing that's over. NFL is here and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is giving you a can't-miss offer for week one. This week, new customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you just bet five bucks on any NFL game. DraftKings is hooking everyone up with game day greatness. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every single game day this September. 
Check the app to see what you get. So download now and use the code CAMPIA to sign up. New customers can take home $200 in bonus bets instantly just for betting five bucks. That's code CAMPIA only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-H-O-P-E-N-Y or text H-O-P-E-N-Y 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See dkng.co slash football for eligibility, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. And thank you to our friends at HelloFresh and DraftKings for sponsoring this episode of the John Campus Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? You know, as much as it is now just a common part of our entertainment landscape, you'd be forgiven if you forget that streaming is still a really brand new thing in you know terms of the history of Hollywood and entertainment. It, it is pretty brand new, and as a result... You know, streaming is still in many ways trying to figure out what it is. It's trying to figure out its identity. It's trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work, all that kind of stuff. Lessons have been learned already, but more lessons are coming. One of the things that we've learned about one of the major streamers, of course, Disney Plus, is that they've decided that the initial thought of quantity, 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 quantity uh, isn't working and doesn't work. We've seen a lot of the streamers in the studio start to realize, oh, you know, it's a challenge generating revenue with streaming. It's a significant challenge. We've already seen a lot of the streamers, including Disney Plus and others, Netflix and, and what have you, going kind of back to the old cable model of let's have an ad supported tier and run <laughs> commercials just like we used to do and and all that kind of stuff. And they're realizing, hey, man, just having these things sitting on streaming, we got to pay licensing fees and we got to pay. It's There are shows literally out there that we have that are costing us money, but not making us any money. That's how you go out of business. And Bob Iger, upon returning to the uh, CEO office at Disney, said, we are going to start paring back what we do. Now, he talked specifically about the MCU he thought we've overburdened the MCU. We've diluted the brand. We're going to start pulling back a little bit, focus more on quality instead of quantity. Because, you know, once Bob Paycheck got in there, they just started, he just started putting out the mandates of fire, 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 more, 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 more. And that's hurt them. They've all said the thing, thing, same thing about Star Wars. Several projects have been canned. But it's not just that. It's other avenues there, too. And in recent days, and over the last week and a half or so, three major shows, non-MCU, non-Star Wars, have had the plug pulled. Uh, check this out. So Disney had, I I'm going to admit, I never saw a single episode of this show. Uh, Doogie Kameloa, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, MD, which is kind of like a re-envisioning of Doogie Howser, mm -hmm. MD. Uh, it already had two seasons. Oh, wow. And I believe they shot a third, but they pulled <laughs> the plug on it. Mm. The Spiderwick Chronicles... Already shot. Poor Christian Slater. Was Slater in that yep. one? Yep. I did not what? know. Yep. I love Christian Slater. Pump up the volume, baby. Um, Spider Rick Chronicles, already shot. Ready to go. Disney decided, nope, pulling the plug on it. Now, it's actually owned by Paramount. Mm -hmm. um, they had just licensed that Disney was going to be the exhibitor of it. but So it's probably going to find a home somewhere else, maybe on Paramount Plus, maybe somewhere else. Also, another series that actually was shot. The Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea Captain Nemo show, The Nautilus, mm -hmm. uh, shot. Disney's decided, you know what? Not going to do it. It's going to get shopped around elsewhere. Maybe it'll get picked up somewhere else. Uh, pulled the plug on it. Now, the big thing about this story isn't necessarily Doogie, isn't necessarily Spiderwick, isn't necessarily Nautilus, but we are tangibly now seeing some of the impact of, let's call it a course correction, that a major streamer, one major streamer, but it's going to be others as well. We've seen Max kind of do this a little bit too, deciding we need to pull back. We need to focus on fewer original programs, hopefully make them better, make them actual attractions rather than a lot of quote unquote filler content. Because let's face it, I have not seen a single episode of this Doogie show. Okay, just, just to be clear, I haven't seen a single episode, so I can't say anything good or bad about it. I have not seen it. But what I can say is this, in my own personal experience and in my own personal circles, 
I don't personally know anybody who signed up to Disney Plus to watch Doogie. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying I don't personally know anybody that's ever said to me, you know, or written into the show to say, you know what? Sign up for Disney Plus this week because I got to watch Doogie. Game day. Game day. <laughs> Game day. Game Doog. I, I Doog. Again, I'm not trying to disparage the show. Doog. I've never seen it. I can't say a single bad thing about it. I'm just saying I don't know anybody that's ever done that. Yeah. I've also not heard anybody. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Have we had a single person write in talking about their anticipation for the Spiderwick Chronicles? I no. don't think so. I, I, I don't think we have. No, again, not to say that it's not going to be an amazing show, but we haven't. And I certainly, like, I love Captain Nemo, to be honest. I think 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is my jam, but I haven't heard anybody write in with anticipation talking about excitement for, for Nautilus either. And I think what you're going to see moving forward, even Netflix, which the running joke on South Park is, you know, Answer, ring, 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 ring. Netflix, you're greenlit, even though that's always been the joke about Netflix. Phone just uh, keeps ringing now. Sandros has, has recently been talking about how they're going to be moving in a direction where they're going to be pairing back and pulling back, uh, all that kind of stuff, because money's being lost where it doesn't need to be lost. And what they thought was going to be the pattern, turns out it's not the pattern. And so, and I think these three shows are honestly... Just the tip of the iceberg. I think we're going to see more of this uh, in the coming months. Anyway, Chris, that you've seen this. Number one, have you seen any episodes of Doogie? What were, were you were you looking forward to, Nautilus or Spiderwick? And what do you think this says about the overall direction of streaming and and things like that? I was aware of Doogie. I didn't watch any Doogie. Um, <laughs> a friend, <laughs> you didn't watch the Doogie. I, I, they didn't teach me how to Doogie. They didn't uh, do Doogie. any of it. <laughs> Show me how to so, Doogie. I, a friend of mine, her partner is um, Native Hawaiian, and I know she had problems with this show with just some of the representation <laughs> oh, on it, and that's okay. all I know about mm. it. Um, but that was it. Um, it seems like a charming, cute thing, but also Disney historically, at least with their Disney Channel original shows, ends or rebrands things after three seasons. So I don't know how much longer Doogie was going to be around to begin with. Right. Um, the other two shows, though, it was oh, they're doing another Spiderwick Chronicles. That's neat. Oh, fun! And especially Christian Slater. That makes me very excited. I love him. Yeah, I'm suddenly That's, now more interested in this yeah. show than I was five now, minutes ago. Now I'm like, but they are. Come on, Paramount. This one they're shopping out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? So well, Paramount we'll will have some options okay. here. Yeah. This one we'll should home. get a second life and everything. Nautilus, I, I love. I was looking forward to this. The I really love that story. I love Jules Verne. I think that would have been really cool. I had no idea they were doing anything with that, Dude, though. Look at this, the, the sets I've been looking at. This is one pool. They had a ton of other ones See, that they were just... That's a lot of money to do this over so and over. Money. And that looks cool as hell. Yeah, And, and it's shot. And they just said, no, we're not going to air it because it's not going to make us any money. I, it's so weird. It seems like such an odd trend i don't know after wb dumped a bunch of their products right that right. were already made and ready to go and now we've got disney doing the same thing it is mind-boggling to think about this is the most cost-effective thing spending b -b billions of dollars and on your shows out. and then going Meh. it's so wild to me that we can just toss things aside like license that. is somewhere then but yeah, yeah that's the thing. sell it's it about, out to somebody it's it's also about i mean look we we come across this all the time it, it's Part of the play here is knowing when to cut your losses. Um, it's kind of like I equ give the equ equation to going to Vegas and playing roulette. It's like, okay, you're down $5,000. You can have the mindset that, well, we got to keep playing to try to win it back. Or you just go, you know what? I could lose $5,000 more. We're just going to cut our losses. I'm not going to play anymore. Not that I ever play roulette or that I've ever lost $5,000, just to be clear. Um, at that, it's if you're sitting down though and saying, "Look, this money's been spent on this. That's how much we've spent, but it's going to cost us an additional this right. to continue the process, the get it everything. properly out, pay the licensing fees, and do we believe Promotions. we're even going to get that much more money back? And if we don't think we are, we got to cut bait. Like we got to cut our losses not, and move on. Not to mention, if this is a series, then there's also the thought of a series season two. Yeah. And it's like, we don't want to have to commit to a season two. So don't even put out season one. Well, and this is where I wonder if the streaming model really just does uh, screw the pooch on everything because we used to have, you know, just the pilot episode. And that's, that's what got shot. I was going to yep. say that um, earlier because, you know, it's like, yeah, you did used to have. Um, sorry, I went to the wrong shot. <laughs> you did used to have, you know, your pilots. Yeah. And then. Even if it got beyond the test and you did a few episodes, we've we've seen 
situations where audiences weren't showing up to view and we had the real data so they would cut it exactly but you don't have that with streaming it just seems so weird this model so much of this model is not sustainable no 100 percent, and yeah. that's why like remember when we're talking about traditional cable television all that kind of stuff you gotta understand it had like 80 years to form develop run and it's coming to the end of its life cycle but that's still it had true. like 80 years to get to where it is this whole streaming thing is still a relatively brand new thing and they don't have all the answers figured out yet which i i mean we're going to get into some strike stuff here in a second which is i think part of the real friction between the studios and the guilds is is obviously the reality now of streaming and a lot of people don't know that they got it they don't have it figured out yet and and what are we going to create these new realities as so it's going to be interesting to see how this one kind of evolves but again i, I don't think we've seen the end of shows getting canceled or having the plug pulled all right, with that down, let's move on to some happy stuff. Let's talk some John Wick. <laughs> I love the John Wick franchise. I remember the first film came out, caught everybody by surprise. It once again resurrected Keanu Reeves' career. Keanu Reeves has had two career resurrections, one with The Matrix, then he was, he was hot, and then he kind of faded away again to obscurity. And then all of a sudden, John Wick came out, and he was the man again. Good Canadian kid, by the way. And all of a sudden, he's the man again, which is fantastic. I love this series. I thought two wasn't as good as one, but then three I loved, four I loved. And if you guys saw John Wick, you know it ends with kind of a way that maybe you wonder if there was going to be John Wick. Now, the director of John Wick uh, came out recently and talked about the fact that you know he's... There's been talks about John Wick 5, the studio's talked about and all that kind of stuff. Well, now the director is also saying Keanu Reeves himself is using the term, fuck yeah, about <laughs> doing John Wick 5. Uh, this comes with some CBR. Uh, Stilisky, who is, of course, the, the director of it, discussed Reeves' enthusiasm for the sequel on the Happy Sack Confused podcast. Yeah, Keanu and I have talked, he said. Keanu, if you ask him right now, Keanu, I should say, if you ask him right now, would you do John Wick 5? He'd be, fuck yeah. But then he'd look and go, well, what is it? I have no effing idea. And believe me, it's not like we're going to figure it out today. We have a lot of set pieces. We have a lot of ideas. We have lots of things that we didn't go or didn't do before. <laughs> I have no doubt that we'd come up with a lot of great pieces. I just, what's the main threat? Uh, we're about myths. It's like a fable. What's the message in the fable? What's the moral of the story? And I love the way Chad, the director, frames that because when, you're, when you look at the John Wick franchise, it's very much mythological. It is very, very much mythological. And when you're looking at John Wick, who's essentially an old style kung fu uh, martial arts film of a ronin making his way through the countryside, fighting off all the enemies as the myth grows and the mythology of it grows. And I love the way he even says it. It's a fable. And in many ways, John Wick is. And I don't want the fable to end. Look, movies are experiential events. I always talk about that, right? And many, many different types of things can deliver the experience. Emotional romance, powerful biopic, great laugh out loud comedy, excitement and thrills in action. It's all about delivering an experience in whichever of those dozens of avenues you take. If you get to the destination of delivering a great experience to the audience, you've done it. And for me, in a John Wick film, to deliver that experience, all I need is more of those set pieces, man. All I need is more of those, you know, Japanese rooftop stairs in Paris, what, like whatever it is, I just need more of those experiences. I need more of that gung fu. And the great thing about the John Wick films is they build a mythology around all of it, right? Whether it's the continental or the high table or the coins or whatever it is, they build this great mythology and then pack it with these insane set pieces. And I just want to see John Wick doing more. So sign me up. I hope this happens. I think it will happen, especially when you look at the box office results that these films have had. Take a look at this. This is a film franchise that has the exact trajectory that studios want, but they don't always get. It keeps going up and up and up and up. 
That doesn't always happen. The first John Wick made 86 million, the second made 171 million, the third made 327 million, and the fourth made 428 million dollars. An R-rated, very R-rated in many ways, um, like action film. And of course they're going to do a fifth one, and I'm going to be all for it. And I love that you know the director and counter are going to say, but we still got a nail. What's it about? What's our new layer of the mythology here? What's the new threat? What are we battling against? We have peace with the high table, so what comes after that? I like that they're asking those questions, but I have no doubt this is going to happen. Anyway, Chris, you read the comments here. Look, there, there could be a good argument to be made. Listen, it's had four chapters. Yeah. It, it's time to put it to bed. Let's move on. You don't want to run it into the ground. Mm -hmm. Quit while you're ahead could be an idea. Sure. What do you think about the comments do you think they should move forward with this franchise and do more? And do you think they will move forward with this franchise and do more? What do you think? Yes and yes. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Because to your point here, not only is it this action movie that's rated R that continues to make more money than the last one, it's an action movie that's rated R, that's incredibly technical, that is beautifully shot, that has yes. wonderful cast members, that stays within a reasonable budget. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why this franchise has been able to thrive so much too, is they're not going just bananas and taking people to space with duct tape. Like they are sticking to what they need to do and building that mythos out more. So there's a lot of reasons for a studio to want to do this. For fans too, I feel like these just keep getting better. And while, I mean, this is pretty far out, spoilers, spoilers, you've been warned. I didn't get warned at CinemaCon, someone told me exactly what happened the minute I got in my Uber and I went, oh yeah, that came out yesterday. I haven't seen it. Uh, but, you know, speaking of resurrection, it already is really hinted at that Sean survived, you know? Well, the director talked about that, right? There that was they a actually cut scene, shot, yeah. They shot a scene showing that John survived. It's very I Am Legend of this is what happened, but they didn't test well with audiences, so there's that. But even in this cut, if you take this cut for what it is as canon, we've got little things like the dog noticing something's amok. Mm -hmm. We've got that line early on to of John Wick is just a ghost searching for a graveyard, mm -hmm. which is very much maybe just, oh, that's the plan. He's going to fake his own death. He's going to try to get away from this life finally because that's what he's been trying to do. But the price on his head just keeps gaining and gaining and gaining. So he had to do something, right? And also when you go to that graveyard, that's not fresh grass. Mm -hmm. yep. No, it is not. That's been buried for a while. So there's a <laughs> lot of things that could be happening here that mean that he didn't die in addition to the director's cut that didn't end up in there. I think people love this franchise. People freaking love Keanu Reeves. He has so much fun doing these movies. I want more of them. And to your point too, as long as they continue to be good, as long as they continue to build on this mythos, because that first movie, the minute they started exchanging coins, I wanted to know everything about that. Yeah. I was fascinated by that. And then when it was, well, you're in luck, Chris, there's so many more of these. I was like, ah! I want to know more about this and I want this movie <laughs> franchise to continue. Great. Can you look up for me? See if you can find a stat on this. Mm -hmm. I want to know what is the body count in the overall John oh, Wick franchise? Okay. How many people they killed? That, that, but you bring up the coin thing. I really would love an answer to this from somebody. A great Bob Odenkirk movie came out in the pandemic. Nobody. 439. 439 yeah, people sorry. died. That's a big labor shortage for the high table of assassins because mm -hmm. he's killed all of them. They're all dead. Yeah. But, you know, the makers of John Wick made nobody right. with Bob Odenkirk, which more people needed to see because it's wonderful. They never say it explicitly, but there are so many similarities and apparent phantom connections between the world of nobody and John Wick, including, you brought it up, Chris, the coins. Also the, yep. Now, I don't know if they looked exactly the same or not, but the principle is there, right? That all these things line up. I would love somebody to come out and just officially say, no, the worlds of nobody and John Wick are not connected, or yes, they actually are. That Bob Odenkirk plays a guy who, though they never call it the table, was a person who served the table and was all, I mean, and then maybe, granted, nobody is not nearly as possible as, as popular as John Wick. More people need to see nobody, but oh my God, can you imagine if they did John Wick 5 and they made it a nobody and John Wick crossover? <laughs> I, I, again, nobody wasn't a huge box office success. 
It kind of looks like they use the same font too in the poster. <laughs> I, I, I haven't to see. You would notice that. I did not notice that. I would drool right up until that movie came out. I would be so excited to see Bob Odenkirk and Keanu Reeves on screen together, oh, ripping yeah. through fools. I I have a, like one request. Let's bring back Halle Berry and close her story because they were supposed to give her a spin. I think the original plan was she was going to get a spinoff. I thought or something. so. Yeah. And then it never actually happened. Yeah, and I also like the new tracker too, the one with the dog. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. He's, yeah. he's in he's Invasion. Great. He's he's great in Invasion. Invasion's not that. Why good. do you always got to bring him? Stop trying to make Invasion a thing. But you Nobody know what? Cares he about because invasion. he's like front and center there, and I really like. Okay, this actor. but to be fair, he hasn't brought up the terminal. Mm. So oh, it might be a trade off. That's that true. In anywhere. <laughs> Ready go. Mm, one or the other. Oh. <laughs> All right. That's quiet, Chris. With that down, guys, me let's wrong. move on to this, shall we? Uh, I don't know if you knew, but there's uh, there's a couple of strikes going on in the world of Hollywood that have shut everything down. Uh, the writer's strike, of course, started first. It started over four months ago now. Uh, and the actors have been on strike. That is starting to stretch. Uh, how Well, Chris, you would know better than anybody. How, how long has the actor strike been going we're on? We're about 50 some odd days. So now? we're closing in on Pushing two months. Pushing 60. Yeah. Which I'll, I'll be honest with you. I did not think it would last this long. Nope. Um, I, I even remember I did an editorial video. And I still believe this. I did an editorial video a while ago saying why the actor strike will end before the writer strike. Because, you know, the studios... Yeah, writers want to go on strike? Okay, we're good for a while. We got tons of scripts. We got tons of things in production. We got a lot of stuff in the can that's ready to go. That's cool. We can have a long writer strike. But the actors going on strike, I said, that changes things because everything shuts down. No actors. You can't be in production on anything. Because remember, the writer strike was going on. They were still shooting Deadpool 3 <laughs> with the writers being on strike. Actors being on strike? No more shooting Deadpool 3. No more shooting anything. And movies that are supposed to be coming out that are already finished are having to get delayed because those stars can't go out and promote those films. And so that I've laid all that out. And I tell you, I still think the actor's strike will be resolved first, but it's already gone longer than I thought it would. I, I got to admit, I can't be the only one. who's <laughs> This has gone on longer than we thought. Well, we've done some stories about the price tags. I mean, the actors and writers talk a lot about the financial burdens this is causing for them. We're hearing from other members and even union leaders of other unions. They're talking about how even though they're not involved in these strikes, it's impacting them. We've heard about how it's impacting surrounding things. Like even, who was it? Was Rob was talking about that? He knows an owner of like an eatery down in Hollywood that's near a lot of the production stuff. And they might go out of business because the people aren't down there working because no production is going on. And of course... We all knew, but we haven't really heard some specific numbers. We knew this was also going to hit the studios where it matters to them the most, their bank accounts. This is coming to us from Deadline. The financial impact of ongoing actors and writer strikes has a number on it now. Or at least as Warner Brothers Discovery said today, it's looking at a hit. Already get this number. Wrap your head around this number. A $300 million to $500 million in adjusted EBITDA. E-B-I-T-D-A, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization for 2023 due to the work stoppages. In a filing this morning with the Securities Exchange Commission, Warner Brothers Discovery said it is expecting lower adjusted E-B-I-T-D-A for the full year in the range of 10.5 or $10 to $11 billion, reflecting the company's assumption uh, that adjusted EBITDA will be negatively impacted by approximately 300 to 500 million, predominantly due to the impact of the strikes. Now, just so you know, that finally with the Security Exchange Commissions also show that their free cash flow has gone up to about $5 billion, but that has a lot to do with the success of Barbie and all that kind of stuff. But as Ray and I were talking about before the show, okay, yeah, their overall cash flow has gone up, but it would have been up by three to five hundred million dollars more <laughs> had the strike not been going on the strikes mm -hmm. haven't been happening right now now look the unions the trade organizations the amptp they, they all knew exactly they had they all have accountants they all knew exactly what's going to happen they all knew exactly what this was going to cost nobody at on any level in this is being caught by surprise but when you start hearing these numbers you know the writers. I mean, some of the writers have been talking publicly lately about we're starting to really feel the pinch of this. 
the studios are really starting to feel the pinch of this. I Again, the thing that to me, and I know I've said this a million times, in talking about how rapidly you know, streaming, we talked a little bit earlier, rapidly streaming is changing and people don't really have a handle yet on how streaming is. I am always flabbergasted and always come down to this. These deals are only for three years. These deals are only for three years. So why won't somebody at the studios, or I don't care anybody, anybody involved in this process. I'll, I'll just I'll just go from the point of view of the studios. Why doesn't somebody from the studios just come forward and say, look, we clearly have some very, very complicated issues here. And we're clearly still pretty far apart on some things. It does sound like there's some things they're getting closer on, yeah. which is good. It gave me a false sense of hope at one point, but at least there are some things they're getting closer on, but there's some things that are still really far apart. Why doesn't somebody from the studios just step forward and say, look, how about we, uh, we're, hey, this deal involves us, so we can change the rules. Why don't we together say, let's sign a deal for one year. <laughs> let's sign a deal for one year and come to some kind of an agreement that we can all live with temporarily, and that gives us a full year to reach a better understanding and come to a better agreement and we can all work while we're doing it. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe somebody did come up with that idea. Maybe somebody from SAG came up with that idea and the studios rejected it or vice versa. I, I don't know, but this is something that is becoming very expensive for everybody involved. And it, it, you, you know, Chris, I've had a couple of moments, you and I've talked, there've been some developments where you and I have talked and I've gone, man, I'm feeling more hopeful now. Yep. Like this happened. And feeling then something about else. These oh, negotiations. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Oh, they're talking again. Oh, a counter offer was finally made. Oh, somebody on the union side said this. And I just get the swell of, you know, optimism. And then it comes crashing down. Oh my God. It <laughs> comes crashing slap down. slap that optimism right on out. It's like that pretty girl who starts talking to you and then she mentions her fiance. Like your hopes go up <laughs> and then yeah. comes crashing down. Anyway, how do you think, you know, these numbers at Warner Brothers is revealing right now? How does this affect your overall orbital viewpoint of where are we right now? Are, 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 like, does this put more of a, the gas pedal to it? Does it even slam on the brakes more? You know, we've been hearing some people talking about maybe the AMPTP needs to break up because some of the whispers have been saying, listen, some of the studios feel pretty good about some of the things, not yeah. everything, but some of the things that the unions are asking for, but it's one or two members of the AMPTP yeah. that are being... Mm. I read an article on Deadline, uh, and I can't remember his name. He was a, a movie mogul. He was the head of... of Fox and, and Paramount at, at different times. And he oh, said, saying the APTP should just kick out Netflix. Kick out yeah. Netflix and yeah. Amazon. They're trying to They're destroy you guys. Kick them out, yep. make a separate deal with the, and let them strike against Amazon and Netflix. Uh, we read the same article. But even then, th that's the thing though. I remember when I read the article, I thought, but this doesn't address the question of, let's say Paramount has a deal and they make their movies. What happens when then they want to put some of their movies on Netflix, on Netflix and Amazon. That's where the muddy waters get muddy. that's the right? issue with the interim agreements right now is everyone's like, yeah, the studio is fine right now. What happens when you sell my movie off later? Right. That's another issue there. The numbers here, what's so interesting to me, 500 million, right? That's a huge number. I want to throw a number out at you too. 429 million. That is what the writers collectively would have received should the AMPTP have accepted their May 1st proposal. At least that's what they claim. They claim. Right. Sure. Which sounds expensive, but in four months, for one cost studio, you five hundred million dollars. Right. This was the collective. Right. AMPTP members would be paying all of the writers that amount of money. We're talking about one studio, possibly losing five hundred mil. That's not taking in everyone else to account. So that number is wild. And Warner Brothers really needs to figure things out too because they're about to take another hit potentially because now video games are particular are potentially going to strike right, for rec uh, for actors too yeah. we've got till september 25th to vote on that strike authorization but it's not all video games much like the amptp it's certain large different conglomerates and one of them is wb games mm. so they are up for potentially losing more money <laughs> right mm. and this one this is for video games we don't get residuals 
And that I don't believe is even on the table for this. I need to double check that, but it's mostly dealing with AI, um, wage compensation, and then just safety for mocap and vocal actors because mm. I know this sounds has really- Has that been an issue? It has been. A really? lot of people, I didn't know that. A lot of people for vo vocal performance end up having to go to physical therapy and things, which I know this is gonna sound so babyish, but when you were screaming and doing fighting noises all day, people have torn up their vocal cords. They you have scarred snapped. the tissue. They have done like irreversible damage to their voices doing creature work that sometimes not all pr uh, production companies follow the proper procedure for that. And that's why I try to always advocate for my students like, hey, you got to tell people when you need to take, take a break, you cannot do a voice that's not sustainable. If you can only do a voice for like 20 minutes, please don't bring it to a booth because you could ruin your entire career. And a lot of companies will be like, I'll oh, just push it. I had a, a client who had to do like screaming at the top of their their thing. And they didn't work for like two months after that because they messed up their voice so much because it was a different voice than their natural one. So that's an issue. But everyone is on the striking campaign right now. So I really think that they need to take a hard look at these things. Both sides, both sides, obviously, right? I've got my own hair bias, but both sides need to sit down because this is ridiculous that this much money is already being lost. That is more than what was asked for in the first place. And I know that's a very, very simplified version of looking at this issue, but those two numbers just are really drawing to me of, guys, can we just try to figure this out so you don't lose more money and all these other people don't lose their livelihoods and their insurance? I feel like we all can figure this out if we just really put on those thinking caps. It's It becomes difficult. Like when you start hearing stories from some of the actors about, I, I remember that one story we covered where there was an actor on Orange is the New Black who was saying they couldn't afford cab fare to get to set. Like that, that puts things in perspective. It, it also becomes more difficult when you realize that even before the strike started, we were do, covering stories on our show about Warner Brothers, Disney Plus, or these streamers losing billions of dollars. And you can you start to get a picture about, now look, I know 95% of the time people side with their, their celebrities. I get that. But this is truly a very difficult situation where you could see why it's complicated. I, I just don't know why, again, I come back to it every time. I don't know why they don't make it, like all the sides don't make it a little bit less complicated and say, you know what? Fuck it. Let, let, let's, let's forget the three-year deal for now. Let's just sign something that we can all kind of live with temporarily so we can keep working and negotiate for the next six months and try to come to, I, I don't know why they're not trying to, but I guess you got stute, you got actors losing money, some actors working extremely hard and not making enough to make rent. You got studios who are putting out these giant streaming things and yet they're losing billions of dollars. I get it, it's complicated. I just don't know why somebody's not stepping forward and trying to simplify it a little bit, at least in the short term to get people what they can at least live with right now and then move forward. I don't know, but it's getting frustrating. It's getting frustrating and I'm sure, and I'm not even in it. So I can only imagine how frustrating those would be for writers, for actors, for, ah, anyway. All right, guys, with that down, we're now gonna move on and start taking topics from our YouTube channel members. Uh, but before we do, we're gonna take another quick second here and thank another sponsor of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile. Guys, we wanna take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Mint Mobile. Signing your life away to a big wireless provider is kind of like being trapped on a roller coaster from hell. Sure, it looks like fun at first. They probably even threw in a free phone, but now you can't get off. Month after month of insane bills and unexpected thrills, like overages and surprise fees. If that sounds like your current big wireless plan, it's time to get off the ride with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just 15 bucks a month. You guys know before before I came to Mint Mobile, I was paying triple what I am paying now on the standard big wireless plan, and I will never go back. All plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped right to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com dot com slash campia cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia 
And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode of the John Campus Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's now go over and hear from our channel members and the topics they would like us to discuss. Chris, what do we got up here first? From Red One Real Talk, I never hear enough talk about Emperor's New Groove. Really? That movie was a hoot as a kid. What did you think of it? I feel like this is one that Disney could easily translate to live action on a reasonable budget. Oh, working I, with animals. Mm. I believe there has been talk about them doing an Emperor's New Groove at some point or another. That was David Spade, wasn't yeah. it? Yes. Yeah. And John Goodman. I got to tell you, I think this was brought up like last month. I think somebody brought up Emperor's New Group. Not one of my favorite Disney films, to be honest with you. I, I don't actively dislike it. Don't misinterpret me. But I don't know that it's one that I ever rewatched. It's it, it was fine. It was okay for me. But I do know that you're not alone. I, I know some people that really, really love that movie. Where is it for you? I mean, Eartha Kitt and Patrick Warburton are amazing in it. They're so funny. I love the whole just like pull the lever crunk. I love her so much, but it's not one that I really go back to over and over again. Mm. Oh, I was All a right. little older for it too. What's next? From Carmelo, here in Toronto, Canada, there's numerous uh, numerous seats. There's numerous seats for the Taylor Swift movie. Well, I mean, it all depends on where you are, um, how many screens. We just talked about this yesterday when we initially pulled up the seats for Taylor Swift at our local AMC, there were four screenings of it on opening day, four. And they were all almost practically sold out. And then we went back and looked again the next day and all of a sudden four went to eight. And a lot of those theaters were well over half full. One of the 10 PM ones was a little bit less than half full, but that's the thing to remember. Like, okay, there's lots of seats, but how many screenings? How many screens is it playing on? How many of those other screens are already sold out? Again, the crazy thing about it is that AMC, this Taylor Swift movie broke AMC's record for the biggest single day ticket sales ever. And it didn't just break the record, it totally obliterated it. Spider-Man No Way Home held the record for on AMC's ticketing website for the most single day tickets. And that was $16.9 million in advanced ticket sales in one day. The Taylor Swift one, 16.9 million. The Taylor Swift one did over 25 million in one day. It didn't beat the record. It kicked the shit out of it. Fandango reported that Fandango didn't give specific numbers, but Fandango said on their ticketing platform, the ticket sales for uh, the Taylor Swift thing rivaled that of Avengers Endgame and Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Or The Force Awakens, I should say. Not The Phantom Menace, The Force Awakens. So, uh, yeah, that means some places you're yeah. going to find screens that there's going to be seats, but here's what's going to happen. They're going to sell out, and then more screens are going to be added, and then those are going to sell out. And remember, we are still over a month away from this thing coming out. Yeah, the second we're, we're talking about how many seats are left for a movie that doesn't come out for over a month from now. That's how crazy this is. It's nuts. Now, again, this thing is not going to have a $250 million opening or anything. It's not going to set that, but a new story just came out that said the exhibitors are, are predicting over a $100 million opening for um, Taylor Swift, which I believe only three movies this year have had a $100 million opening or more. Mm -hmm. I Now, this might age badly. I could be totally wrong about this. But I believe this is going to get closer to $170 million opening. I think this Taylor Swift movie is going to end up being the biggest opening weekend of the year. Now, all this, the exhibitors are saying $100 million. Get that? That would still be amazing. That's still crazy. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be the number one opening weekend of the year. We'll find out. if I, I could be right. I could be wrong. We'll find out. Yeah. But I think it's going to get pretty nuts. All right. What's next? From Joseph, if the SAG strike ends before October or November, how soon would the actors be able to participate in film promotions, red carpet premieres? Five minutes after. Immediately, it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. As soon as the deal's done, they're they're greenlit to go right back to work. So, I mean, then the question will be, do they have a red carpet ready that day? I mean, so there's going to be a little bit of a buildup, probably. Yeah. But but Chris, are we right in saying that yeah, the moment that deal's signed, they can immediately you start? Can they can get on jump you can, on Instagram, you can get on live. social media, and start posting immediately, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's next? From Sam Fisher, I just learned that Double Indemnity, Sunset yep. Boulevard, Seven Year Itch, and Some Like It Hot were all the same person, Billy Widler. And he has an insane story that includes escaping Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. I would love to see a biopic about him. That would be amazing. There, What I love, I, I like true story biopic things that aren't necessarily about musicians. But 
What I really love are these remarkable stories that people didn't know. It's one of the reasons why um, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's film uh, about the decoder. Oh, uh, I, oh, why am I freezing on the name of it? But it's one of the reasons why I thought like that one was absolutely mind blowing. Um, so I would something imitation like that. Game? What's that? The imitation, imitation game. Uh, imi imitation game. Um, absolutely phenomenal. I would love to see something like this. I think that would be a great idea. All right. What's next? From Kayak. Despite Taylor Swift's worldwide popularity, the Eras Tour movie will be released only in North America. Is it too tricky for someone outside of major studios to release a movie into other markets? Yes. Or is it international and we should expect the second film to be released worldwide once international part of her tour is over? It Distribution is such an important and very tricky part of the movie business. And it's why, like we talk about there being two main arms of the film industry, production, that's the one everybody talks about, but distribution and having those connections and having those, those businesses set up and having those relationships where you actually have an avenue to get your film onto screens wherever. It's not just a, it's, it's not like a convenience store, just go in and pick out what you want. I have a feeling though, that while AMC is covering the the distribution in North America, th they'll come up with an international deal. They'll either partner up with one of the major distributors, whether it's a Warner Brothers or Disney or something like that. And I think once they're able to show these distributors the numbers they're getting domestically, because remember, Taylor Swift and her people first went to the major distributors before they went to AMC. And they were not simply not hearing terms that they liked. And unlike independent filmmakers, they have the power. Taylor Swift has the power to go, I don't like your numbers, so I'm going to go do something else. A lot of <laughs> independent films don't have that power. Taylor Swift does. And so she found another avenue. And I think the success they're going to get from this domestically is going to make these major distributors loosen their terms a lot to acquiesce to what it is Taylor Swift, and you're going to see it in international distribution. I, I think we will see it at some point. It just might not be until we get closer to the release date uh, domestically. So we'll find out. All right, what's next? From King Daddy Goat. Hey, gang, hope everyone's doing amazing today. John, I know X actor and X role isn't your forte, <laughs> but I heard Jeff Schneider said apparently Josh Hartnett has been offered the role of Dr. Doom. I know it's all speculation, but I'm praying this is true. I've been dying to get more Josh Hartnett since the Black Mirror episode. What's your opinion on this? Thanks and bring on the filthy. Well, I love Josh Hartnett, and he just did a little film that absolutely nobody went to go see called Operation Fortune with Jason Statham, directed by Guy Ritchie, and it was really fun. It's a really fun, and Josh Hartnett was great at he's it. He's also an Oppenheimer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right, yeah, and he's great in Oppenheimer another, too, right? <laughs> no, no one saw that yeah, one. Yeah, no one saw yeah. that one either. Yeah. Man, Pearl Harbor really upended his career a, a little bit, which is really too bad, but um, he's fantastic. I wouldn't take anything so-and-so's been offered a role at any face value right now. Um, obviously, nobody is talking about casting or roles or anything like that. Um, and, you know, Fantastic Four, I don't even know where they were in the development for this. Now, look, if Jeff said he heard that, I'm sure he heard that. But that doesn't mean it's true, right? What is true because Jeff would never lie. If Jeff says he heard that, then that is what he heard. I just don't know that I believe that what he heard was true. So I, I, I wouldn't put any stock in that, but I'd be all for it because yep. I think he's a great actor. And uh, we also, what is true is that we will get one casting rumor for Fantastic Four every week. Every week, at least every one. By the way, I know I don't do X actor in X role. You know who would have been an awesome Doctor Doom? Who? Ray Stevenson. Um. He Ray would Stevenson would have been a fucking awesome Victor Josh, Von Doom. Josh Hartnett got the height with him, though, to be a Doctor Doom. Well, I mean, yeah, but he, he's, he's the tallest guy in Oppenheimer. Everyone, he's, he's yeah, in all the scenes, he's always <laughs> just all the guy. Down, everyone. Super short. He's what? a surprisingly big guy, actually. But that I, Black Mirror episode too. He is charming as all get out, and terrifying. When he snaps in that episode, you're like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, this is not okay. And you see it all. Oh, it's so telegraphed and you know it's going to happen, but it's still done so well. Oh, Ooh, you know who else would be a really good Dr. Doom? Who's the, the sexy Skarsgård? Alexander? Yes. 
Alexander Skarsgård will be That is correct, John. I'm glad you about, <laughs> refer to him I'm sexy. so glad I'm here. He's a sexy one, right? Not Pennywise, but, uh, but you he, know. That show he does with Nicole Kidman and Reese Witherspoon. Big Little Lies. Big Little Lies. Man, his character in that, like, when you see the evil side of him, mm-hmm. it's like, you you could be a pretty good Doctor Doom, too. Anyway, there's a few good options. Yeah. yeah. Justin Long. I don't Kevin know. Hart. Just oh, I would love to see Justin, Justin Long's Doctor Doom. <laughs> Kevin the socially Hart. awkward Justin Doctor Long Doom. Justin Long in the MCU, you cowards. Yeah. By the way, I know it's a joke, but I love let him. me just be public. I, I it's love a, Justin It's a Long. joke, but I, lo- I like him. But I, love, I him. love him. I wish I he was in wonderful. more stuff. I never joke disparagingly. Didn't he oh. have a stint where he was doing uh, Apple products? Yeah. Like oh, yeah, yeah. He was like great ads, to be honest. And John Hodgman was the PC. Yep. Those were fantastic. It, I, I adore him. I love, 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 love Justin Long. I, Jeepers I, Creepers. Jeepers Creepers, Galaxy Quest. Galaxy Quest. Uh, what was the one you do with Drew Barrymore about the long distance relationship? I think oh, it was shoot. Called, I, I think it was called name. Long Distance. You know what's so He was in Tusk. The last time I've seen him was in Jeepers Creepers. Really? Yeah, you know, I he also had a really else. good little stint on uh, New, New Girl. Girl. He's great on New I Girl. I don't watch New Genslinger. Girl. Oh, and um, what's the other name? Something in Miri make a porno. Zach and Mary. Zach and Mary make a porno. He's a Him great role. And Brandon Routh. Uh, Brandon Routh as a couple in that. I laughed every second they were on screen together. Justin Long should be a major superstar. I love this guy. Mm-hmm. Anyway. All right. What's next? Come on the show. Jeff. Oh, and Dodgeball. Dodgeball. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Sorry. Come what's on. Next? <laughs> From CJ Rebirth. What do you guys think of the Casper movie with Bill Pullman and Christina Ricci? I grew up watching it on VHS as a kid, and I think it's a delightful comedy. It's a cute little movie. I, again, not one perfect. that I ever went back to. I probably watched it twice the year it came out. I never went back to watch it again. I watch it every year. That's it's, the one. Of yo, the you like it that much? I love it. Oh, I love that it's movie. It's a cute little movie. It's fantastic. That's one of the movies I remember Anne buying the VHS tape of with her own money. Really? She was always so proud when she bought something with her own money because it was like, you know, she would collect Christmas money, whatever. She that's still one, is. One of the movie. One of the movies was Casper. I, I think that's the only movie I remember her buying and like being so proud of. I never watched it with her though. I haven't oh. seen it at all. It's a good one. All right. What's next? From uh, Carmelo. Hey, guys. The One Piece live action is currently the number one show. <laughs> oh, wait. We read that already. Oh, we that one. <laughs> okay. From Woodcut Art. Let's read it again. <laughs> when studios are faced with strikes, how much movies do... Uh, how much do movies need to have in the can to survive? With the way negotiations are prodding along, it seems they have movies to show for months. It seems the Taylor Swift movie was a monkey wrench in their plan since they cannot promote their movies without the actors. I mean, that's the big thing. You know, I, I had somebody else ask me that the other day. It's like, well, you know, the movies that were being shot right now weren't going to be coming out for a long time anyway. They have a lot of movies in the can and a lot of movies in post-production that they can still work on. I got a friend of mine who runs a big visual effects company and they're still working on projects and products to that are already shot and filmed. Yeah, they, they've got a lot of that, but uh, not all of them. A lot of these movies need their stars to go out there and be able to promote these movies. Like these movies represent giant, giant, giant investments that, you know, the people working on them got paid, but the people who put up the money for it are stand to lose millions, if not tens of millions, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars. So you need those stars. You need those actors to get out there, for, for, not for every one of them, but for a lot of them, to, to be the faces of the movie, to go out there, pump and promote the films. And so, yeah, you may have finished product in the can, like Dune 2, but it may, you know, behoove you to wait until you've got that strike settled. So, yeah, big deal. Uh, they need to get They need to get the actors out there doing their jobs though and uh if they're not available to do that a lot of them are having to wait and delay which created a perfect opportunity for taylor swift to sweep in with her little swifties is that what they're called <laughs> swifties yeah. yeah with their swifties and and try to make a big impact perfect opportunity for them to do that all right what's next from uh Darylist. john i've supported you ever since the amc days was a Aww, patron, thank you so much, man. Now a monthly subscriber for over a year, but I think if you start in OnlyFans, that's where I might draw the line. Unless Jeff Pleasure's cameos, then it's breaking all the records. Now, oh, I've said for a long time, a, maybe not said's not ugh. the right word. No, let me rephrase. I have threatened for a long time that I'm going to start a reverse OnlyFans. <laughs> now, here's how my reverse OnlyFans works. Oh, boy. <laughs> you subscribe for $10 a month or... I send you a weekly dick pic. 
So if you do not want to get the weekly dick pic, you got to subscribe to my reverse OnlyFans. So if you sign up for 10 bucks a month, your inbox is safe. That sounds illegal and like crime worthy. Probably. Well, no, it's... um, But I'll make um, a fortune. Blackmail. Yes, it's more black tail. Black tail. Yes, but I will make a fortune you in my what? reverse there's, only fans. There's, there's many guys that do that. I think for free. <laughs> like I mean, <laughs> but yeah. see, so you got to pay to not get it. I'm going to make a ton of money. All right, what's next? <laughs> From Ian, Arcane season two has been announced for winter 2024. What's your excitement level, and has the long wait dampened your excitement at all? It completely has. It completely has. When did when did season one come out? Twenty twenty one. I think. I want. Can go. you double check that? Yeah, when did yeah. Arcane season? We literally gonna be waiting three years in between seasons. Twenty twenty one. Okay, three years in between seasons. Cool. I have time to. It's catch not up. acceptable. It's not acceptable. I have time to watch it. Do you remember how hyped I was? How long, and how hyped I was? It it is my favorite animated show of all time. One season, and it's my favorite animated show of all time. But yeah, my enthusiasm is gone. I'm, I'm sure they're going to find a way to get it back, especially if it's as good as season one. But all my hype, I had I had hype for over a year after that show. But not having a plan to, hey, in, in case of success, what's our game plan for being able to get another season produced in a reasonable amount of time? And I'm fucking sorry, but three years for television is not a fucking reasonable amount of time. And I get it, they're extenuating circumstances. I, I get that, but that's why you guys make the big money is to plan this shit and be ready for it. Um, so, yes. And look, again, I'm saying that now, but when it comes out, I'm going to get some of my enthusiasm back, but it's not going to be as fiery hot as it was within the first 12 months after that movie came out, or after that show came out, because I was passionately in love about with it. I evangelized it all the time on this show. But it's like anything else. I, I don't care how beautiful the plant is. If it just keeps sitting there and not gets watered, not gets attention to, it's going to wither and die. And my enthusiasm for it's gone. Yeah. Thanks, gone. viewer. Thanks, viewer, for ruining John's day. Well, no, no, it wasn't the viewer. <laughs> your dumb question. It's this big, you know, like, long delay. Check your emails for a picture. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> Spam. <laughs> All right. What's next? From uh, Daryl again? I think Whatever. The realist. The realist? The realist. The realist? Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> whatever happened to the Shogun series that was supposed to be on Hulu? Uh, shot, done, in the can. I can't remember when the release date for it is, though. Uh, and, and technically, it's effects is the network that's being produced for, which means it'll be on Hulu. 20, 20, 20. Um, so it's done. It's shot. They completed production. I, I just can't remember what the, when they said was going to be their target window for um, releasing it. I don't see anything yet. Right? But there's very few things coming out on television that I'm as excited for as I am Shogun. That The original James Clavell novel is one of my favorites of all time. The old miniseries was absolutely fantastic. So I, I don't know when it's coming, but I do know they shot it. And it at some point... It's 2023, so... Yeah, they'll announce a release for it at some point, but it's coming. All right, last question of the day. What's next? From Tyler. Hey guys, where are your guys' anticipation for Loki season two? I remember being on the edge of my seat for season one coming and this just kind of feels dull. Marvel needs a few solid things to come back to back. I hope this is one of them. Bring on the filthy. I remember, because Loki is absolutely one of my favorite characters in the MCU, in, in my top two or three favorite MCU characters. And so I was super excited for Loki season one. I, I personally, I don't think Loki season one was bad. <clears throat> but I was a little underwhelmed with it. I was a little disappointed with it. I thought overall it was pretty good, pretty good. But I, because I, I'm such a fan of the character and, and the way Tom Hiddleston plays him, um, that I found it to be a little lackluster. And I thought Owen Wilson in it was fantastic. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not all that excited for Loki season two. And it's not just because of Loki. Again, because the first season of Loki, I, I generally liked it. But between not being thrilled with the first season and their track record for the Disney Plus shows being subpar and coming off of a pretty brutal secret invasion. I Listen, I'm not saying that this show, season two, can't be fantastic. I'm not saying that. It absolutely can. But... I, I would be lying to you if I told you I was excited for season two. Um, am I going to watch it opening day? Absolutely am. I'm going to be tuning in opening day for sure. But am I really excited about doing it? Again, I'd be lying if I said I was. I don't know, Chris, where's your anticipation level for it right now? 
Uh, yeah. Um, I mean the the trailers have looked cool, but it is just kind of. Eh. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's random. It's, they're not even good trailers. They're like random shots. Like, yeah, I have no idea what's going on here. Well, I I do love time travel, and that's a trope that I really enjoy. And I know you're not as keen on. Yeah, that was big. So, and I love Tom Hiddleston. So I want to be more excited about it, but it is just one of those. Oh, yeah, look, he's gonna happen. Well, it's just kind of like a fool me once, right? Fool me twice. So like now it's been like seventeen times. Yeah, now. but I mean I. Personally, I'm looking forward to it. I like season one, season but I'm good. not like, oh yes, this is gonna be the one. I'm done doing that. I'm yeah. done going. Mm. This is gonna be the one that turns it all around. Exactly. Even with Star Wars, I'm just like, I'm just gonna take this on its own. If I like it, I like it. If I don't, I don't. Mm-hmm. And correction on the Shogun. It's now it's 2024. Okay, sometime. Sure enough, yeah, sometime 2024. So guys. That'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here, making this little show part of your day. Big special thank you to our YouTube channel members. Uh, Number one, for being YouTube channel members and supporting what we do, but also for sending in your questions and giving us some fun things to talk about. I want to thank the people in the room with me, Ray Or. Yeah, it's still Tuesday, baby. (laughs) Your excitement for Ahsoka is palpable. That's what it's about, right? Jonathan Boyko. Never know what to do to follow that up. Chris Carr. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Have a good one. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.